Ships often change hands, bought by new owners for one reason or another. They are often rebuilt and made over to varying degrees of success. Well, you all seem to love the first five terrible ship makeovers video that I did the other week, so let's do it again and look at five more terrible ship makeovers for your morbid curiosity. Number five, the RMS Strathnaver. Okay, so just so you know, I'm not being biased with my picks for terrible ship makeovers here. I'm starting with a ship that I actually personally adore. This is the RMS Strathnaver, a p and ocean liner introduced in 1931. I have a personal connection with this ship because it carried my family to Australia in 1959. But boy, did P&O do a number on it. When the ship was first introduced in the 1930s, it was a massive step forward for the company. I've actually done a whole video on this, and it's an interesting topic. You should go check it out. But suffice it to say, Strathnaver was a huge departure from P&O's previous ships, which all kind of looked the same, like this. Old fashioned, with drab, dark paint schemes and thin, black funnels. Strathnaver was totally different, and very radical. The ship was painted white, and its funnels were painted a nice golden buff yellow colour. But it was the ship's exterior design that was the most notable difference. It was tall and blocky, but beautifully balanced with three round, squat funnels and a long sweeping profile. She served through the 1930s and was a really popular ship for the time, but then the Second World War came and Strathnaver did its bit sailing as a troop ship. When the war ended, P&O found itself with most of its pre-war fleet surviving intact, and Strathnaver was set to be put back on the old route to Australia from England. But P&O wanted to modernise its appearance. You see, Strathnaver was built right at the very end of the era where the more funnels a ship had signified its speed, safety, and size. But by the 1940s and 50s, that era was long gone, and now it was all about modernity and minimalism. The fewer funnels, the better. P&O had introduced a few running mates inspired, clearly, by Strathnaver's design, like the Strathedon here. But they had been designed with only one funnel. Strathnaver by 1945 looked like it belonged to an older era, so the funnels had to come off. The ship went in for refit, and when it emerged, it just looked sadder. The first and third funnels were cut off, because they weren't actually functional, only the middle one was. This left the ship looking unbalanced and a little ungainly. The chunkiness of its bridge was kind of endearing when Strathnaver had those three jolly funnels to balance it out, but now the ship just looked like it had a massive forehead. The war had been hard on the ship too, she'd travelled millions of miles by the 1950s, so her machinery was just really tired. Her interiors were a shadow of their pre-war glory too, so P&O put Strathnaver to work as a one-class migrant ship, a very far cry from the silver service that had been offered in the 1930s. By the late 1950s, the ship was frequently breaking down, so much so that she earned herself the nickname Scrap Naver. So in 1962, the grand old lady was pulled from service and scrapped in Hong Kong. Number four, the Castel Bianco. In the last video, I introduced you to Mr. Alexander Vlasov, head of the Italian Sitmar line, who made some considerable success in the Australian migrant trade. His MO, and that of many of his European competitors, was simple buy one of the thousands of cargo ships built for the Allied war effort, which were no longer useful and just sitting around doing nothing, and convert it into a humble passenger liner to carry hundreds to new lives in the USA, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. Some of these conversions were really extensive and resulted in some truly gorgeous ship makeovers, but others just outright kind of failed, and Castelbianco was one of these. In 1947, Vlasov bought the almost brand new SS Vassar Victory, a Victory class cargo ship built in 1945, right at the end of the Second World War. Her wartime service therefore consisted only of repatriating American troops before she was laid up and sold off at a bargain. First, Vlasov employed the Vassar Victory as a cargo ship for service around South America and renamed her Castelbianco. But soon he had designs to use her for the migrant trade, so he set out to convert the ship. It hadn't been smooth sailing though. On Castelbianco's first round the world voyage in 1947, the ship had collided with two other cargo ships, ran aground and then got caught in a horrendous storm which badly damaged her. She limped into Sydney Harbour and had to stay for two whole months while repairs were carried out. And it was here that the ship received its first large scale passenger accommodation, with very humble quarters for 480 people being fitted. For the next few years, Castelbianco ran a number of passenger voyages for poor migrants and refugees and was rebuilt a couple of times. 
The first rebuild in 1950 didn't look great, but it did the job and the ship could now carry 1,132 passengers. But by 1952, it was seven years after the end of the Second World War and migrant passengers could just be a little bit more discerning about how they travel to the new world. Vlasov and Sitmar realized they might have been a bit conservative with the 1950 Castel Bianco makeover, so they got to work rebuilding her again. And boy, did they take to their new task with gusto. Two whole new decks were added on top of the superstructure, featuring promenades and sport decks. The clunky cargo masts and booms were got rid of, the old cylindrical funnel was replaced with a slick modern one, tall, crane-like davits now carried 24 huge lifeboats high up on the decks, and even more passenger cabins were put into the hull. Inside, the ship received slick new interiors and comfy passenger lounges. Basically, the new Castel Bianco was almost unrecognisable and actually looked really nice. But wait a minute, Mike, I hear you say. Doesn't that ship kind of look a little, uh, I don't know, too tall? Well, if you notice that, then congratulations, because you picked up on something that Castel Bianco's engineers did not. All the excess weight, the two new decks, and the rows of lifeboats, which all weighed tons each, caused Castel Bianco to become hopelessly top-heavy, and the ship became known as a terrible roller, even in a flat calm. So if you're traveling to Australia, this probably wasn't the ship to catch if you had seasickness. The ship only lasted two years with Sitmar before it was placed on the market and bought by Spanish Line, who didn't really seem to care too much about the top heaviness and the bad rolling. The ship was again renamed Begonia, and the ship sailed for another few years until being sold for scrap after an engine fire in 1974. Number three, the MV Georgic. There are some shipping lines whose names alone inspire visions of glamour and luxury. Names like Cunard Line, French Line, Italian Line, and the White Star Line. But White Star Line's MV Georgic, once the toast of its fleet, was a mere husk of its former self by the 1950s. Here's what happened. In the late 1920s, the White Star Line planned to introduce a new superliner, a competitor to Cunard's Queen Mary and the French Compagnie Générale Transatlantique's SS Normandy. The ship was going to be a thousand foot long, three funnel behemoth, much in the style of White Star's previous ships, prioritizing luxury and comfort over speed. But then the Great Depression hit and the plan came to a grinding halt. The new ship, which was supposed to be named Oceanic, was canceled due to the economic downturn and White Star had to go back to the drawing board. The company had been building a smaller, more economic diesel-powered ship to serve alongside Oceanic, named Britannic. Now, with Oceanic having been cancelled, White Star instead decided to build a smaller, similarly sized running mate to Britannic using parts of Oceanic's incomplete keel. The new ship was named Georgic, and like Britannic, she was a medium-sized, nicely appointed, diesel-powered motor ship. The ship had two squat funnels, which were very in vogue at the time, but only the second one was actually functional. The forward funnel contained only the radio room and the engineer's smoking room. Introduced in 1932, the Georgic proved to be a reliable and popular liner alongside her running mate Britannic. But then in 1934, the White Star Line merged with its old rival Cunard, who managed to command a majority share of the new organisation, now known as Cunard White Star Line. Now regardless of the new ownership, Georgic and Britannic plied the transatlantic trade until 1939, when the Second World War rudely interrupted things. In 1940, Georgic was converted into a troop ship and got to work evacuating troops and civilians from France in the wake of the Nazi invasion, moving troops between the UK, Canada, and the Middle East. In 1941, though, the ship's luck ran out. At anchor, waiting to take on a load of Italian prisoners of war, German aircraft spotted the ship and bombed her. She was hit twice with bombs, the first, which glanced off her side and detonated in the water, damaging her hull plating and causing flooding but the second plunged deep into the ship's hull and detonated in a cargo hold, sparking a raging fire that engulfed the ship's stern section as oil and ammunition began to explode. Somehow though, the ship's crew and captain, who were absolutely nuts, realized that they could still start the ship's engines and steer her, so they got the blazing ship underway and beached it on a reef so that it couldn't sink. She was abandoned and left to burn for two days, flooded, resting on the bottom with blackened superstructure and her hull totally gutted by the fire. That's where the Georgic story should have ended. The ship was a write-off. Except it wasn't really a write-off, because surveyors of the Hulk found that while the ship's interior was a gutted wreck, the basic structure and machinery were still somehow intact, so it was decided to salvage her. It would have since been described as one of the greatest feats in the history of salvage, the Hulk of Georgic was stripped down, plugged, and refloated. The ship was towed to Karachi, where for eight months she was repaired in the most basic sense of the word. 
Still gutted by the fire, the ship's engines and generators were brought back up to working order, and some very basic crew accommodation was put in. In March 1943, Georgic was able to sail under her own power into Liverpool at an average speed of 15 knots, which is actually pretty remarkable. She was sent back to her builders, Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, for total overhaul and reconversion into a troop ship. The workers had to strip out 5,000 tonnes of fire gutted and twisted steel, and the superstructure had to be completely rebuilt. The new Georgic, completed in 1944, looked completely different to the elegant motor vessel she had once been in the 1930s. This once great lady of the sea was now a utilitarian workhorse, and when the war ended in 1945, the ship was actually owned outright by the British government and operated by Cunard White Star. She was then again converted into a very basic migrant ship, and her White Star line colours were reinstated, although that's just about where the makeover ended. Sadly, the ship's profile had been totally ruined. The forward dummy funnel was never replaced, so the ship now had a strange, off-balance silhouette. Her foremast was shortened to just a stump, and the luxurious interiors were never refitted. Instead, the ship carried only one class of passenger and basic dormitory bunks. There was one obvious telltale mark of the fire left over, though. The ship's hull plates had been warped and bent by the heat from the flames, and they were just never replaced or straightened out, so the side of the ship was all wobbly looking, and she was nicknamed the Corrugated Lung because of it. Which I don't think is exactly the kind of PR or marketing the White Star Line was going for. Anyway, this migrant trade didn't last long for Georgic, and she completed some more trooping voyages for the Korean War before being pulled from service and scrapped in 1955. Number two, the SS Norway. Oh boy, okay. Uh, I know this one's probably going to upset a lot of you because there's a lot of people who have very fond memories of the SS Norway. She was a good and happy ship, but this video is all about vapid aesthetic judgments and so many of you brought this ship up in the last video's comments that I just had to throw it in. So here we go. Norway's story as a cruise ship is as unlikely as it is triumphant. Essentially, she just wasn't designed with the role in mind. In the 1950s, Company Générale Transatlantique known as French Line, realised that they needed a superliner to replace the Normandy, which had been lost during the Second World War to a fire. To recreate that ship in spirit, the company built an enormous, sleek and elegant ocean liner named, fittingly, France. Introduced in 1960, the ship was the longest passenger vessel in the world, a record she actually held up until 2004, and was quite simply eye-achingly beautiful. The ship was so long and her profile perfectly balanced by two enormous funnels, which had wings. Who doesn't like wings? Just look at them! Also, the French line's paint scheme just looks stunning on France. The crimson funnels and black and white hull really enhanced her swooping hull form. On introduction, the ship was one of the chicest afloat and the toast of France, except that she'd been introduced maybe just a touch too late. At this point, the world was moving on and jet aircraft were taking over the transatlantic trade. So French Line put France to work on some winter cruises and world cruises, but it was the 1973 oil crisis which doomed the ship. She was pulled from service and put up for sale. The world's longest passenger ship sat idle and unsealed for four years, basically a time capsule, until 1979 when she was sold to the Norwegian Caribbean Line. The Norwegians took their new purchase in for overhaul and renamed her SS Norway. Initially, they didn't do too much to alter the massive ship's external profile, as many of the changes were internal but the paint scheme was changed and the ship was now all blue and white. She still looked pretty gorgeous though and stayed that way until 1990. The Norway had actually proved a smash hit and was beloved around the world, so Norwegian Caribbean wanted to improve on their formula for success. It was this 1990 makeover that damaged the ship's external profile. On top of the old bridge, a huge blocky structure was added, basically two whole new decks containing 135 new passenger cabins and suites. Just like the Strathnaver, now Norway looked like it had a massive forehead. But the plan worked. The new cabins were very popular and it kept the Norway in service for a good few years yet. Also at the ship's stern, a new overhanging pool deck was installed, which really didn't do much for the ship's external appearance. All up, by the late 1990s, the Norway's squat exterior was a very far cry from the sweeping, floating palace that French Line had introduced back in 1960. But regardless, she was a very popular cruise ship and is still remembered fondly by many. In 2004, Norway cruised for the last time before being sold for scrap and dismantled at Alang, India in 2008. Number one, the SS Rindam II, aka the Atlas. This one's a bit of a head scratcher for a couple of reasons. In the 1950s, the Holland America line was really building and introducing a suite of fine modern ocean liners, and one of them was the SS Rindam II. 
The ship was originally intended to be built as a freighter, but she was instead completed as an ocean liner for the company. So her lines were a little bit stout, but given the ship was converted mid-design, the end result was actually quite pleasing on the eyes. Rindam was a pretty ship with a single tall funnel towering over a modern, sleek superstructure. She wasn't a big ship, 500 feet long and some 15,000 gross registered tons, but she was functional and served as a reliable post-war migrant ship taking passengers for new lives in the United States. When that trade dried up, however, the ship was put on the market for sale and snapped up by a Greek cruise line named Epirotiki Line and was extensively rebuilt. The designers and engineers really lent into a 1970s aesthetic for this one, and what emerged from the shipyard in 1973 was, uh, was this. They decided to make everything curvy. A curve here, a curve here, why not? It's the 70s. Oh, and they turned the funnel into whatever this thing is. Why? It's the 70s. From the side, the ship now kind of looked a bit like some kind of spaceship and... Oh, hold on a minute. What's that? What is that? I've been researching this ship for a little while and I still have no idea what this thing exactly is. It's painted black at the top, maybe to hide soot, and in a few photos I swear I can see smoke coming out of it. Was it a funnel? I don't know. If you know, please leave a comment below. Anyway, the newly named Atlas was introduced as a cruise ship with interiors that can only be described as peak 1970s. It was eventually sold to become a floating casino and ended up named the Pride of Galveston, which is kind of funny because by the 1990s the ship was a neglected floating wreck, permanently moored on the Mississippi and now named Copa Casino. Real classy, the ship was run down in an absolute eyesore. Port authorities ordered the ship's removal, so she was sold at the scrappers. Under tow for destruction in India, however, the ship decided to go out on its own terms and promptly sank in 2003, which is fair enough. What did you think of these five ship makeovers? Were they terrible? Do you disagree with me? I'm sure a lot of you will hate me for putting Norway on that list, but uh, kind of had to. Just look at that forehead. If you have other ideas for terrible ship makeovers you want me to cover, leave a comment below and I'll go and give it a look. But until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.